time. So praise the Lord for that. So that's next week. Hey, would you stand up to your feet very quickly? And we're going to stretch one last time before we go into a time in the word. Everyone doing well, right? Just not all it was. Don't shout me down tonight. Amen. All right. Just checking. Amen. 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 Stretching, getting the blood flowing. Amen. Jim Dignan, happy birthday to you, mighty man of God. God bless you guys. Let's show him some love. His birthday coming and celebrating with us here on a Sunday evening. Amen. And then Gio, man, if you can just help me with the, the, this mic just a little bit. It's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of like I'm talking into like a can. Hello. Doesn't it sound a little strange? Or is it just me? It's just me. Okay. All right. It's, it's the way it is. Malika, how are you? Good to see you. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. We're coming down the final stretch of a series that we started several weeks back called Irresistible because I don't know about you, but my God, he's irresistible. He's just amazing that way. We serve an irresistible God and we preach an irresistible message and we're called to be irresistible people. Some of us are more resistible than irresistible, but God's working on us, amen? And uh, it's work in progress, and that's okay. And uh, so I'm excited for what the Lord's doing in this house. We say it every week that uh, unless God builds his house, we're just a bunch of busy people. But uh, he's building his house, and we're saying, let's not mess it up. And we're along for the ride, and it's been a fun journey thus far. God's got great things in store for us uh, for not only the distant future, but the immediate future as well. One of these times, we're going to have a time of just sharing testimonies, sharing stories, and just talking about the goodness of God, of how God's been showing up in our own personal, individual lives lately. We all should have a story, amen? We should all have something to be thankful to God for. We don't have to be thankful only at Thanksgiving time, amen? But we get to be thankful year-round, and uh, so one of these Sundays, we may just have to do that a bit. But I want to continue our series of on the theme of irresistible and if you have your Bibles I want to go to the book of John and if you could go with me to John chapter 15 that would be amazing amen John chapter 15 now I just came back from a weekend where uh, I had the privilege of serving down at City Church San Diego a great church they've been going strong for I think about 14 or 15 years and uh, just a thriving church they have three services over their weekend and uh, along with a great friend of mine, Bill Norton, we went down there to minister to their leaders, to their pastors, to their interns, and then to the entire church. So we flew down Thursday night, and then Friday morning we got to meet with their interns and minister for about two or three hours, and, and we had some prophetic ministry, and uh, it was a powerful time. Then Friday afternoon they took us to uh, do more tough ministry, and I said, whatever you do, whatever you do, please don't place any pictures on Facebook. My wife will kill me for leaving her with the four kids and going to do tough ministry at Del Mar Beach down in San Diego. Amazing place for anyone who's been down there, just a gorgeous beach, but we're not going to talk about that. And I was praying and interceding, and Brother Bill Norton needed to be baptized in those waves, and I was sharing with the folks down in San Diego. I said, if a picture's worth a thousand words, a video of Bill trying to surf is worth well it's priceless actually and it was quite the scene and it was awesome so we got to hang out and hang out with the, the pastors there and then the next day Saturday man we we ministered all day long and I don't drink like energy drinks but I said they said would you like anything else maybe coffee water I said Red Bull <laughs> I need a little something right at the end we need the real anointing and the fake one too just to keep the brother going and uh, so we ministered I think about for about six hours during the day and uh, we started a, the last session of ministry, Pat, at 3 o'clock, went all the way to 6, and then we went into worship, and then I had to preach. Uh, it was just a crazy, awesome day. And then this morning, we ministered for two more services. So um, it's been a good week so far. Amen. So I, I don't believe that I'm bringing the leftovers. I actually have a word in my heart that I believe that God has for us today. And uh, I'm excited to share it with us all. But uh, like we say it every week, uh, quiet church or a... Uh, a quiet church, dormant church, sleeping church is a dead church. So I give you permission to say amen to the preacher and to preach with the preacher, to wave that hanky if you want, fan a brother or sister while you're doing it, and it's a good thing. It's a win-win all the way around. Amen? John chapter 15 from the NLT. Let me read a couple scriptures with you here, and, uh, and then we'll preach together. It says this. Jesus is talking, of course, talking to his disciples, and he says, I am the true grapevine. 
And my father is the gardener, and he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. Let me pause right there. Now, I don't know a whole lot about Napa or Solano County or all the vineyards up there, but I guess, I guess vines can grow, and they can grow to be pretty long with a lot of different branches, if I understand correctly. And then there's different seasons, and the grapes come, and the grapes go, and if you leave them there long enough, they turn into raisins and all the other great stuff. Jesus is, is using an analogy that is very relevant to them. They understood full well what wine was and what grapes were. And he says, uh, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches. We're in this together. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And he says, God the Father, he's the gardener who comes. And he looks at the vine to inspect it and see, is it good or is it dead? And he comes and inspects and, and he says, uh, anything that is good, he still trims because by trimming the good branches, even more fruit comes from it. And I'm going to get into that a few mo in a few moments, but sometimes we're like, why is it that God seems like he's putting the squeeze on me and things are going good? I'm not walking in sin, but I feel the pressure. Pressure doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. Maybe you haven't walked away from the things of God. Maybe you haven't been making poor choices, but it's like, why is it that I feel like in some areas there's just not as much life as there was perhaps just a few weeks ago or a few months ago? That could be the hand of God actually pruning us so that you can be even more effective. Amen? And it goes on to say, then he says, you have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. And he says, remain in me and I'm going to remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is uh, severed from the vine or cut off from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Come on, if we're going to be fruitful, we got to be tapped into the vine. If we're going to be those who are effective, we're got to be tapped, tapped into Jesus, the one who is the giver of life. And then we're going to kind of skim through a few verses real quick to get towards the latter verses here. Verse 5, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches, the, those who remain in me, and I in them I will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. And by the way, there's kind of a symbology there. The people of God, the Israelites, the Hebrews, they, they had the call of God. They were of the race if you will, that had been chosen from God. But if they didn't, ex uh, if they didn't uh, uh, include Jesus in, in their relationship and their approach to God, you could have all the religion in the world, you could have all the, 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 the titles, the names or whatever, but if you weren't connected to him, he's saying you, you're going to be cut off. And, and he's, so, so this, this is kind of the context here. And, uh, but if you remain in me, he says, and my words remain in you, you may ask for whatever you want and it will be granted. What? Ask for whatever you want, and it's going to be granted. God, I need, a, I need a new car. God, I need a spouse. God, I need whatever. It says, remain in him, and it will be granted to you if you ask according to his purposes. Amen. Verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my, my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. And then he kind of brings it down the final stretch. Verse 9, I have loved you even as the Father has loved you or has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And this is my commandment that love each other in the same way that I have loved you. And there is no greater love than to lay uh, uh, one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends. And if you do what I command, and I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything that the Father has told me. And then the big key verse. Some of you guys are getting more Bible right now than you've gotten all week. Come on, let's be real. So like, mm -hmm, we just read a lot of scriptures right there. And um, verse 16 is our, our key verse for tonight. And it says this, you didn't choose me. Jesus is talking here. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Another verse that says to produce fruit that would remain. Not just have a little short-term, little successful season, but to have results that are actually lasting for a lifetime, for eternity perhaps, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And this is my command, love each other. Tonight we're talking about irresistible fruit. Talking about results, the effects of actually being used of God to see things succeed and, and it being irresistible. Let me pray real quick and... We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us tonight. Amen. God, thank you so much for tonight. Lord, I thank you for this house. I thank you for our church family. I thank you, Lord God, that you're building this house and we get to be a part of it. Thank you, God, for meeting our needs. Thank you, God, that you know everything about us and you're building us up to be the vessels that bring you honor and glory. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to even share tonight. Help me, God, to communicate those things that you've placed in my heart. 
Father, bless the hearers and cause us to not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. Bless each one here tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. So um, again, by virtue of perhaps me hanging out at the beach a couple days ago and just kicking it in the sand and watching the waves and Elena just not knowing it. Um, it was just a great memory and uh, jumped in the water. We got to surf just a little bit, but then it brought back memories of the days when I was a younger kid, just going to the beach with the family and you play in the water for a long time. And the mama says, all right, that's enough. Come back and get some rest, get some fruit, get some more uh, sunscreen. And then one of our favorite activities to do was to to grab our little buckets and then go grab more water and we would build a big trench if you will and and then we'd pour a lot of water and we'd run back and get some more and then we'd have this big old little big little big old little pool and um and that was just our water base because from there we'd start building little castles anybody been there done that right so you start pressing the sand down and you get it wet and you compress it and you pound it down and then you like use the little buckets to form the little walls and and I remember Mike this is pretty fun and uh, um, so we start building the walls and then the little palace and then the little gate and you'll start carving the little gate so you can kind of play like you're driving through it or doing whatever and then we would always like build this little trench around the walls just like in medieval days castles had like these little trenches of water all the way around remember those cartoons or movies right so that's what we would do we would dig that little trench around the walls and we pour more water and it's like wow that's amazing and hours would go by and then there was always some idiot kid just as you turn to go do something some idiot kid would think that it's oh dude this would be hilarious if we did this and they go and pretend like oh they accidentally just fell right in the darn castle that you spent two hours building does that ever happen to you do you have any stories like that at all it's like all that work and it's wasted what happened or maybe, maybe I did that to some other kid. I don't know. I'm just saying. And um, the point is, it's like, man, we, with those castles, we would put hours into something that was so temporal. We'd see it for a moment, but in, a, in a, just a few seconds, boom, it's gone. It's wasted. All that energy, all that effort, and it just short-lived. What's crazy is life in some ways, for many of us, it's kind of like that. We exert a lot of energy. We put a lot of effort into stuff that is just so temporal and you wake up and you look back and it's like man all that time all that training all that energy all that stress all that anxiety all that worrying all that talking all that and you look back and it's like Shh, it was worthless what was i thinking have you ever been there before come on to the person next to you i've done that before i know what he's talking about you all know what i'm talking about it happens to the rest of us it happens to all of us this idea of spending our time, and we've talked about our treasures, the treasures of life that we have, time is probably the greatest one, because we got limited time. There's 60 seconds in every minute, 60 minutes in every hour, and well, 24 hours in every day, and then there's seven days in a week. I mean, there's limited time. At least for all of us, it's equal. It's fair, y'all, because it's equal. Time is one of our treasures. Obviously, finances are, are one of our treasures. And then our abilities, what we can do, that's a treasure as well. How is it that we are investing our lives? How is it that we invest our time, our finances, our resources, our giftedness? What is it that we're, we're using those things for? And what are the results that we see? Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he knows, man, I got a couple knuckleheads in this team right here. I got Peter. He's crazy. I love the guy. Ah, Peter. Thomas, dude, the dude is always dowdy, man, but that's all right. I still love him. I got Matthew, I got all these different guys, and Judas is always wanting to carry the money. What's wrong with that dude? It's like, and he loved his boys, but he's trying to get their attention, and he's saying, listen, listen, listen. I'm the vine. You're the branches. Good things are going to happen as long as you remain in me, and I remain in you. As long as you're plugged into me, you're going to see success. As long as you're tapping, tapping into me, you're going to be effective in what you do. But Peter, trust me, I know you. And there's some more things coming down the road here. Um, if you try to do it out of your own strength, you might have some success for a short season of time, but it's going to be short-lived. And it comes down to, don't, don't out-preach me here, come on. Um, the verse there, the key verse, and it says this, verse 16, he says, but check, check this out. He says, you, you, you didn't choose me. I chose you, and I appointed you 
to produce lasting fruit. It's been destined for you to produce lasting fruit, to be successful. If you're going to build a castle, may it be one, who, one that lasts for a long time, not just a short-lived, a few minutes, a few hours, but let it be something that is successful, that will have a, a mark for life. He says, if you tap into me and you hang out with me, if you're in me and I'm in you, then you're going to succeed. You're going to produce good fruit, lasting fruit. Just reading this right here, I was like, you know what? This is powerful. One verse right there. We, we can unpack it. Let's do that together. We're going to unpack this one verse. Watch these four bullet points. And because I came in a little bit late, I didn't even give the media all of my notes. But number one, I want you to, to be reminded of this, that first thought. Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. When it comes to life, God looks and he says, I choose you to be on my team. I choose you to be on my team. Just this last week, I've got an email very important email and it got my my heart just 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 skipping a beat or two I'm like yeah getting excited because it came from Yahoo Sports and it says the NFL draft is right around the corner it's like man we're not even in June yet the draft doesn't happen until like late August but da -da 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 -da. all of us guys and some of the gals it's like man we're going to draft our teams for fantasy football ladies by the way this is not like one of those romantic fantasy things no this is just legit sports it's all good all right just for the record the disclaimer out there um but we get the the, the guys together and then we have a draft and the clock starts ticking and when it's this person's turn to pick they have about 60 seconds to pick from any of the available players that are on the board they can say should i get a quarterback should i get a wide receiver maybe i should go for another running back what should i do Whatever you do, don't get a kicker. I mean, that's just that's a waste of a pick. But um, we get to pick when it comes to life. Is that right? No kickers in the first 15 rounds. Don't do that. That would be a bad decision. Well, when it comes to life, you didn't choose Jesus. It's not like, okay, mm, yeah, let's see. What religion should I go for? Should I go for this one or that one or that one? Dude, that guy has a big belly. What is it? Should, maybe I should that one. Uh, you didn't choose him. The Bible says he chose you. He predestined you to be a part of him. He throws out a call to us, and we get to RSVP and respond to him. I was praying over this, this gal this week, and again, we were praying for a bunch of people, and, and she had a sweet spirit about her. And I'm like, you know, the Lord just says he loves you, and, and he's wanting to let you know that he is for you. And all of a sudden, I'm looking, and I go, hey. And it's like this picture came to me, and it's something that I tell my, my kids all the time, my boys particularly now. I said, and I'll tell my boys, and I said, if all the little boys in the whole wide world were standing in a straight line, Daddy would pick you, Jaden, and you, Ethan. And they're like, yeah, say it again, Dad, say it again. And with this gal, it's like, hun, this is going to sound really strange, but if God the Father had all the gals in the whole wide world, and there could be billions of them all standing in a line, he'd look through, and he'd pick you every time. And she broke the gal that had been abandoned she didn't have a father the, the, the dad had left the mom the family and she felt the rejection of a of a father she had a father wound she didn't know her dad and here I am I'm praying and God's letting her you know what I choose you I love you unconditionally I care about you and if all the little girls in the world were standing he would choose you again and again and again why because you're the apple of his eye he loves you when it comes to to our walk with Jesus you think that you might have found Jesus, but you didn't find Jesus. Jesus had already found you because Jesus wasn't the lost one. We were lost. There's a song that said, I found Jesus. And we understand what the guy was saying. I found Jesus. He was walking distracted or whatever, and then he found Jesus. The truth is, if we we're going to be honest and we're going to be theologically correct, he's not the one that was lost. We were the ones that were a mess. We were the ones with our wheels spinning and our heads just spinning around, confused, dazed and confused and living in the dark. But he comes and finds us. What's crazy is this. The Bible says, while we were still enemies of God, distant from God, Christ came after us. Christ died for us. That's how much he loves us. While we were enemies of God, we didn't give a rip about the things of God. God still chose us. He still chose you. See, God doesn't look for perfect people. God's not looking for people that have it all together. God's not looking for people that, oh, wow, Holy Spirit, did you see that? That guy is spiritual. Wow, let's choose him. 
That's not the way it works. I have no idea where that list is coming from. But um, God says, I choose him or I choose her. And it has nothing to do with what you do. It has nothing to do with your performance, whether you've been a good person or not so good of a person. God loves us unconditionally and he chooses us every time. Oh, somebody needs to hear this tonight and be reminded of this. You don't have to earn God's affection. You don't have to qualify for God's love. He's loved you before you were even conceived. He knew you and he called you by name before mommy even knew you or called you by your name. <laughs> he had a nickname for you before your daddy did. Oh, come on, somebody. God chooses us. He chose you. Jesus saying, you thought you signed up for this internship program? You think you signed up for this rabbi school and following this rabbi? No, 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 no. You, you didn't choose me. I chose you. The book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says this, you are, and now let me read it from the NLT version. New Living Translation says, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out, out of darkness into the wonderful light. It says, you are a chosen generation, a chosen people. Another version says a peculiar people, a unique people. Very special kind of people. We are a chosen people. God chooses us. And he says, you know what? You may have been like living in sin. And you've been, you're my son, but you've been acting like the devil. It's like, you're my daughter, but you've been acting like someone that's totally unlike who we are. But I love you and I choose you. And regardless of what your past is, I call you a royal priest. Someone with royalty. Someone with royal blood and you're called to represent God to man and man to God. That's your call. That's your portion. And so the story, just because it's fresh in my memory bank right here, as we were ministering over this one couple down in, in, in San Diego, I laid hands on them, and as I began to pray, all of a sudden, it's like the Lord says, they come of royal lineage. They come from a royal lineage. And I see, and, I, and I'm, I'm praying, I, say, I just say, you come from royal lineage. And everyone starts laughing. Ah! And I'm like, oh, did I say something crazy? And uh, uh, the Lord says that you're like a prince. And everyone in the crowd is just laughing and busting up and crying and laughing. And I'm like, either I've missed it by a mile or I nailed it. One of the two, it's, there's no in between. Come to find out later, this guy, he and his wife, actually pastors on staff down there. He's the, he was legitimately a, a legitimately a prince from Nigeria. His dad at some point was like the top dog in Nigeria. And then years later, it's like, and then he's in San Diego. And the Lord, the Lord says, you're a royal lineage. I'm like, wow. But guess what? We all are of royal lineage. At the point that we remain in Jesus and we're connected to him, God the Father is the king. And we get to be kings and priests. We have royal blood within us. Not because of our own doing, but because of the blood of Jesus that flows through us. Because we're connected to him. Oh, somebody needs to hear this to be encouraged tonight. We're not here to just get by in life. You're not here to just wake up, make yourself some coffee, suck up some more oxygen, go to work like a crazy little hamster running around that little circle, little wheel. And at the end of the day, you just go back, make yourself another cup of coffee and go to bed. And then you start again tomorrow morning. You go through the, tr the routine time and time again. You start with hair and then you wake up the next day and you don't have any more hair. Lady, you need some Rogaine. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Man, that went south real quick. Okay, scratch that. Um, <laughs> ah, going through the routines, finding yourself going, what is my purpose? What is the meaning of life? Listen, you're called to be royalty. God wants to use you. He wants to accomplish great things in and through us. He wants there to be tangible fruit that will remain. Now, someone, if you're kind of like me, I'm not a gardener. Um, is it a green thumb? I would be more of a brown thumb because anything that I plant dies. And uh, so I, are you a planter? Do you know how to do that kind of? I, I, I just recently started mowing the lawn. I think I shared this story with y'all. And uh, um, so I'm not really good with like trimming branches and stuff like that. I don't, but I, I think I understand the analogies a little bit. I think I understand a little bit. When it comes to fruit, we're not talking about God wanting us to have like organic fruit. Oh, I got apples. What did you bring today, Jim? Oh, I brought bananas. I, we're not talking about that kind of fruit. We're talking about the effects, the results of the things that we do. God's called us all to live lives and to, to accomplish different things. And there's different types of fruit or results of the things that we give ourselves to. You understand what I'm talking about here? And it shouldn't be just temporary things. 
true, there are certain things that we do that will be short-lived because their purpose is meant to be short-term. But what would be the result of your life if, if you were to unfortunately graduate to heaven now? Let's say, and I'm not prophesying this over anybody. I don't sense any of that at all whatsoever. But what would happen if perhaps a Mack truck just were to encounter your vehicle and it wasn't you running the red light, but they did. And all of a sudden, boop, you're no longer with us. And we're having your memorial service. What would people say about your life? What would be your story? What would be your legacy? What would be the fruit? What is it that people will look back and say, well, they had a great sense of humor. They did this, that, whatever. But what would be the lasting fruit? What is your legacy? What would they write about you? What is it that we do right now that has genuine impact on people's lives that they'll remember for generations to come? What is it? Jesus says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I chose you. And that's just comforting because for some of us who play basketball and Cano's not here so we can pick on him a little bit, but um, different ones who play uh, sports or whatever. Um, I used to hate, like, when, when it's time for two captains to pick teams, I used to hate, like, waiting, like, hurry up, pick somebody, and whatever. It's like, whatever, as long as I'm not the last guy picked, I, I'll, I'll be all right. But that sense of just emptiness, come on, somebody pick me, pick me. And uh, some of us could, could go through some more inner healing and be healed from past bruising, right? But uh, when it comes to the things of God, God chooses us. He already chose you. Before you did anything good, God chose you. He chooses us. Number two, because it says this, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you. When it speaks of appointment, it means that God it's almost like the knight who, like, knights the individual for the task at hand. He appoints you. He, he sets you up, puts the, the armor on you that you're going to need, and says, all right, I'm appointing you to go and do this. And I'm appointing you to go and do that. And each and every one of us is, is called of God and then appointed of God to produce great things, to see great things happen, to see great things accomplished. The cool thing about life is that we don't appoint ourselves. That's comforting right there. We don't appoint ourselves and us guys we were hanging out this last week together at our life group and we were talking about the call of God that finds us and we're talking about how God the Father in, in Matthew chapter 3 Jesus goes to his cousin John the Baptist and and he says baptize me and his cousin John the Baptist says I'm not going to baptize you you should be the one baptizing me he recognizes that Jesus is just not an ordinary guy but Jesus says you don't understand prophecy must be fulfilled all righteousness must be fulfilled Baptize me. Now, Jesus didn't need to repent from any sins. He hadn't accomplished or done anything wrong. But to fulfill God's desires and to fulfill prophecies and to set the example, he was baptized in water and he came out. And as he came out, it says that there was a voice from heaven that says, This is my son whom I love, and in him I'm well pleased. This is my boy, and I love him. People are like, What? And it says that this dove came, a picture of the Holy Spirit, and landed on Jesus. Sound effects? <laughs> a dove came. And it's a beautiful picture of all of God's deity in one place at one time. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whoosh, all there present, right there. And God the Father affirms. He says, this is my Son, and I'm well pleased in Him. I'm affirming Him. I'm validating Him. I'm endorsing Him. And then we were talking with the guys. The very next chapter, now it's Matthew chapter 4, it says this. It says, Then the Spirit of God led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. Another version says, To be tested for 40 days. Dang. That's a long test. And it says that he went, he fasted and prayed for 40 days, and the devil came to test Jesus. What in the heck is God thinking here? Is he schizo? What's going on here? I mean, he just validated his son. This is my son. I love him. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God leads him into the wilderness to be tested. How can that possibly be? God was saying this, Jesus, I've already approved of you before you did anything. This is before Jesus had done any healings. There were no recordings of miracles or teachings. Before Jesus started his miracle, he was baptized, and then he's tested. And the purpose of the test, you know what the purpose was? To validate the call of God, to prove that God was right. See, I'm well pleased with him, and he's going to pass the test. The Bible says that God will never test you beyond what you can bear. When, you, when he allows tests to come your way, it's simply to prove the real you that he's called you to be and to say, see, I was right. 
I put my name on this, on this person. I've endorsed this individual, and they're going to pass the test for the glory of God. That's what it's about. And Jesus, not once, and it says that the devil came and he tested him three times. He says, if, uh, if you really are the son of God, then uh, turn these rocks or these stones into bread. Maybe some Subway sandwiches or something. Because I know you're hungry, and if, if you really are the son of God. Remember, everyone had heard the voice. This is my son who I love. And the devil's like, oh, really? And the devil challenged the call of of God on Jesus' life. He questioned, if you really are, and he questioned it, challenged him. But Jesus, his response wasn't, uh, but God said so, and yeah, I am the son of God. Dun, da, da. He didn't do that at all. He didn't fall for that. He actually quoted, it is written, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds or comes out from the mouth of the Father, from the mouth of God. He doesn't play games on the devil's turf. For that matter, Jesus doesn't play games at all. And he sets an example for us. You don't have to defend your credentials. When it comes to appointment, you don't have to defend your appointments. You don't have to defend your call. God's called you, he's anointed you, he's appointed you, and he sends you out, and you don't have to defend that. That's comforting. Well, the crazy thing is, is, man, and for those of us who've been around the Christian circle for a little while, I see so often people come and feeling this sense of entitlement. You don't understand. I've already buttered it up. I've kissed up to so many leaders. It's my turn out to be the leader. And, and they want their rights. They want their, their preferences and their preferential treatment. And it's not about that at all. Jesus says, remain in me and I will remain in you. You didn't choose me. I chose you and I've appointed you. What matters the most to you? The kingdom that God builds, he protects. The kingdom that God builds, he provides for. The person that God builds, he provides for, he protects. If you're building your own kingdom, then you're gonna have to protect it yourself. If you're building and trying to fulfill your own calling, then you're gonna have to provide for it yourself. Jesus says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Am I preaching to somebody here tonight? Well, it's getting a little warm in here. Some people are kind of like, mm-hmm, praise the Lord. It's like, it's okay to just kind of stretch if you have. You can just give that person next to you just some little love and comfort them. Amen. The first thought is that God chooses us. The second one is that God is the one who appoints us. God chooses the where and the what. When it comes to your destiny, you don't get to fill in the blanks. God already has a destiny for you before time. Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For God knows the plans or the destiny that he has for you, plans to prosper you, not to hurt you, but to give you hope in the future. God already knows in advance. He has good things in store for us. He's got a great plan for you. <laughs> and if you're like me as a kid, it's like, Lord, whatever you do when I grow up, I don't want to be a missionary to Mozambique or Africa, God. Whatever you do, I'll do whatever. I'll cut any deals with you, but just don't send me to Africa, God. No! <laughs> I was already a missionary kid, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't want to grow up and go to Africa to some other country, speak another language, oh God. And, deals when it comes to to God's destiny for our lives he's already got it predetermined for us and he's wired watch someone needs to listen to this and hear this one carefully he's wired you and placed passions within you for your good you thought it was your own desires why is it that some people like to go shopping ladies why is it that some people like to go to sporting events guys and a few ladies why, why is it that God's wired us the way that we are the Bible says we were fearfully and wonderfully made. We were created in the image of God. God knows exactly how he's wired us, and he's pleased with that. And because of the destiny that he sees for our lives and the journey that, that, that is entailed here, that is included, he's wired you in a certain way for you to hit the mark every time. So why is it that for some of us we have a propensity where, like, I like to stay home and just chill and relax and watch TV all the exercise that I need, I can do right here with the remote. You know what I'm saying? Whereas for others, they like to go outside and they like to go to the beach and they like to go shopping and they like to go out and not stay home. And they... <laughs> Some of us, we could stay home and just relax, make food, order food in, do whatever, just <gasps> and kick back and relax. Where for others... Others like to just go out all the time. 
But that's how God's wired each one of us. And we're unique. There's a unique destiny. And that's all right. There's nothing wrong with your passions and desires as long as they're within the parameters of honoring God, right? Pastor, you don't understand. I have this real passion for, for just getting high. If it's in the Holy Spirit, that's awesome. If it's not, well, you need to uh, make some adjustments. Oh, come on, somebody. The desires that we're talking about, the greater passions of life and so on. The destiny that God has for us, he's wired you to fit your own calling, and you're going to hit the mark of God. As long as you're on track with him, you will hit it every time. He's chosen you, and he's appointed you. You're going to go. You're going to make it. You're going to do it. And the comfort, comforting verse, and we hear it time and time again, is that the righteous person, they mess up. They fall many times, but then they get back up. Why? Because you weren't destined to stay down. We mess up, we make a mistake, but there's grace. Grace finds you right where you're at. Grace finds you. Grace, grace knows where to find you. Even when you're trying to hide, the grace of God still comes and he finds you. And he says, let's get back up. We got a destiny to fulfill here. I've appointed you to bear good fruit. And fruit that will, re that, that, that will last, that will remain. And which takes me to the next one. So God appoints us, he empowers us, and then he sends us out. He's the one that launches us. <laughs> It's so interesting because every family has a unique culture. <laughs> Some families, it's kind of like they, the, the kids grow up and they know this. At the age of 18, whether I want to go to college or not, whether I want to leave the house or not, dad and mom, they're giving me the boot. I'm going to have to grow up and get a job and get on with life. Then there's other families, and the kids are always welcome to stay home, and that's cool too. And then, you know, it's like, son, uh, maybe it would be a good idea for you maybe to, like, go to school and, Maybe get a degree in something and maybe a part-time job would be helpful. I mean, you are 43 now, so, um, <laughs> and you got these extremes. And, and uh, within every family, there's a different culture. Within every individual, there's a different culture. When it comes to the destiny of God, there is a set time from God. He calls us, he appoints us, and then he gives us the boot. Do this. And have you ever been like in that position where it's like, whether you liked it or not, it's like, you're on the front of a freight train, and it's pushing you whether you want to go or not. Uh, I didn't ask for this. Where did this come from? And you find yourself moving. And it's like, you didn't sign up for that. That's okay. God says, I'm sending you, and here we go. Whether you like it or not, let's do this. And things begin to change. All of a sudden, your employment situation perhaps changed. And you're like, what happened? Everything was looking good. The boss said that a promotion was coming my way. Next thing you know, what? By the way, not every closed door is a bad deal. Not, not every closed door is the devil. Ooh, the devil trying to resist you. There are some times where God says, you know what? I'm going to close this door to get your attention so that you're proactive to go to the next door that is much better than where you're at right now. There are some doors that will close in front of us, and it's not meant to harm us. It's just simply meant to cause us to look to him and say, God, Obviously, you've got something better for us. Maybe you're looking for that job or the housing situation and certain things don't play out the way that you had hoped and it's like literally the door, the door closes and you can't move in. Well, maybe God has something better. Maybe there's a better place. So you, you understand what I'm talking about here. Maybe that relationship wasn't meant to be. Man, your heart was invested. You already started dreaming of the future together or whatever and all of a sudden, Argh! your heart is broken and Maybe that could be God. Say, I'm, I'm sparing you from something here. I got something better. God calls, he appoints, and then he's the one who sends out. He is the one who launches out. And our heart and our response should always be, Lord, Lord, whatever you want, not my will, but your will be done. God, I don't fully understand it. I don't see the big picture most of the time, but God, I know that you're good. And you have my best interest in mind. And God, I trust you. God, you've been faithful thus far, so even though I'm not fully understanding, fully understanding what's going on right now, I know that you got good things in store for me, so I'm going to trust you. Help me to trust you. Uh, and you start going, and you keep going. Sometimes God says, go. And he, he launches us, and he sends us out, and next thing you know, it's like, uh, I don't want to go there. So we go hang out with Brother Joe. That's Brother Jonah, you know what I'm saying? It's like you find yourself with Jonah in another boat, going to another destination, and then all kinds of crazy storms start coming your way, and it's like, how did that happen? Man, I love Jesus. Don't people understand? I went through the Life App class. I got my discovery diploma. I'm a type whatever personality. But you're hanging with Brother Joe, 
and Jonah is running away from God. <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. And Oh, I can preach on that for a little bit right there. Sometimes God sends us and we take a little detour, but God knows how to find us. And in his mercy, he doesn't let us get away with murder, if you will. In his mercy, it's like, man, why is God being so mean? He doesn't want to let you get hurt more, sis or bro. He doesn't want to let you destroy your future and sabotage the great plans that he has for your life. So he pulls the leash a little bit. And some of us are like, man, I don't know that I like this Christian thing, man. It seems like there's so many rules and regulations. No, no, no. Guardrails are there to protect us. If we're traveling across the Bay Bridge, and especially if you're coming from the Oakland side over through right before Treasure Island, right? The bridge, all of a sudden, there's like slow down, and there's that tight little turn right there. And on, on a windy day, well, it's crazy right there. Imagine not having the little guardrails on the sides, the little walls on the side. People hate resistance. They hate, like, why is it that God has a man being a Christian has all these rules and regulations, and I can't do this, I can't do that, and I shouldn't do this, and man, God is so mean. He's a big party poover and it's like and we fight God and we complain no 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 oftentimes we don't understand that those guardrails are there to preserve us to keep us from calamity to keep us from destruction because he loves us the Bible says he chastises us or corrects us because he loves us he brings discipline to our lives because he loves us he keeps us on the path that we need to go on it's not for your destruction it's for your protection Am I preaching to somebody here? God chooses us, he appoints or anoints us, and then he sends us out. And in the process of sending out, he comes alongside. Have you seen that car commercial? I think it was BMW. We got little flying little angels <laughs> flying next to the car. It's like surround sound. You got four little angels on each corner. And the cars turn all of a sudden, boop, you know, they're going to drive off the road and the little angel pushes the car back. Well, actually, that's in some ways a bit biblical, actually. Sounds crazy, huh? Someone's like, are those like little love angels true too you know we're not going to go there but the bible says in psalms that he will give his angels charge over you meaning that he they're there to to protect you to to help you and by the way i'm not here to to say oh start praying to your angel we don't do that we pray to jesus amen he will give his angels charge over you not us give it hey hey angel um how you doing man we don't do that. We don't converse or talk to our angel. God is the one who sends them out. But he's there for our good. He's there to protect us. Am I preaching to somebody here? God wants our good. Somebody needs to believe that. God wants your good. So he calls us. He appoints us. He sends us out. And then he says, and then you produce the fruit. Now, I'm not talking about the fruit of the Spirit like we talked about last week in Galatians. There's two types of fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. God produces that fruit through us. In this particular passage, it's speaking of the results of your actions. The results of the work that you're doing. Go and do something with your talent. Go and do something with your gift. What is it that you're doing? How are you spending your life away? What are you good at? Is it making a difference? Is it changing people's lives? Go and bear fruit. Bring good fruit and fruit that will remain. That was his challenge. Now, we understand that with the disciples, he's telling the disciples to go, man. I'm going to anoint you. You're going to do miracles, signs, and wonders. You're going to lead people to the Lord. They're going to be followers of Christ, which is all of our calling as well. Jesus continues to say, go and bear fruit and fruit that will remain. As for City Life Church, we're not here just to have a, wow, a couple years of a lease at a building downtown. And then when the lease is over, like, guys, it's been a fun ride, those Friday Night Lives awesome those interns that came from other cities those times whoo a lot of work but that was a great memory wasn't it wow malika being baptized at the beach whoo that was a highlight for us this is not a little sprint race for us the fruit that will remain is not just what we see right now but it's for generations to come it's when javier is getting married to that precious uh, bride of his this hop too, possibly. I'm talking about the other Javier, the baby one, the young one. And you go, what? Yeah, that's the fruit that remains when you've raised your child in the ways of the Lord and they grow up and they too are following after God and they're in love with, with the house of the Lord and they have the fear of God within them. They're making good choices. They're succeeding in life. Then you say, you know what? That's fruit that remains. You chose wisely to invest into eternal things in their lives and rather than just kind of like, well, enduring. Am I preaching to somebody here? Fruit that remains isn't just something that you see overnight. It's a lifetime. But the choices we make today 
are the results of tomorrow. You're not going to have good fruit tomorrow unless you start today. Am I preaching to somebody tonight? I just, I got so much. I mean, I've been preaching all week and I could keep on preaching and rambling. I just, there's a lot in me here about, we don't want to just be here kind of going through the motions. But we want to be a church and we want to be a people that are effective indeed. Part of our call, our call for this, this, this house for the city, it's to impact a city. It's not just to have great services. And I praise God for our wonderful worship team and everything else, but it's not just for us. We want to see fruit and lasting fruit that will remain. I shared this story, I think, with you before that when I first became a youth pastor within the first few years, this mother came to me and she says, I just want to thank you, Pastor Jonathan, because you're such a great youth pastor. She says, my kid, you know, he was kind of giving me some trouble and he's got a strong will and uh, he likes doing things his own way. And, uh, but ever since he started coming to the youth group, it's like, he really respects you. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. He said, and she says, he's really turned around. And I'm like, wow. And he's still in junior high. She says, I just want to thank you. You're a great pastor. You're probably like one of the greatest youth pastors in all of the United States. I said, please stop. Let's no. <laughs> And I remember just responding and saying, you know what? We actually don't know if that's true. We don't know. I appreciate the compliment. Thank you for the kudos, the attaboys. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you. You're very gracious. I hugged her. You're awesome. But you know what? We don't know if I'm a good youth pastor yet. And I remember just this, coming, this confession coming out, coming out of my mouth. We'll know if I was a good youth pastor when your son is a grown man serving God with all of his heart, diligently pursuing the things of God, not next year, not two or three years from now, but 10, 12, 15 years from now, then we'll know, wow, you really were a good youth pastor. And there's fruit that has remained. That boy today is in San Diego. His name is Dan Hill, and he's in the Marines right now, being prepped. Great young man of God. Junior high kids, strong will, a bit stubborn at times, and was giving his mama some trouble. She says, I need assistance. We got some trouble in aisle nine. And sometimes it takes a village to help a brother, but man, I am so proud of him. So proud of him. A great man of God, and we love him. In a few more months, he'll be back to, to help us out some more. Maybe we did do a few things right. I can share many stories of the things that we didn't do right, but in a few things... There has been some good fruit that has remained. The pastors, and kind of wrapping this time up, the pastors were asking me, so, and your wife, your family, and you guys went and started a church and teamed up with another family, and uh, um, so, so who came with you? And uh, where'd you guys raise them up from? And I, I said, wow, it's interesting because our team, apart from a very wise couple a little later in their years, they were all, Knuckleheads. I mean, they were all young people coming through junior high and high school ministry and interns and serving in the house of God. They, they grew up right in front of our eyes. And next thing you know, some of them were getting married. Others were pursuing different career choices. And all of a sudden, they're, they're adults full of the Spirit of God, full of passion. And they love us. And there's fruit that has remained. Even if we wanted to leave them, they still came with us. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> The very first meeting I had as a youth pastor, Andrea was there. She then used to be Andrea Freeman. And Andrea was one of the most faithful girls there. There were times where other girls were mean to her. I remember as a youth pastor just being annoyed. It's like, wow, little clicks, clicks that happen in church, clicks that happen in youth ministry. And it's like she was always the, the, the gal that was always willing to just befriend everybody, but then they would form these little clicks and like kick her out and shove her out and we did our very first mission trip. It's like, guys, we're going to do something crazy. We're going to go on a mission trip. Andrew, the first one to sign up. We started Bible studies on Sunday mornings. Andrew would come. Never missed one Bible study that I can remember. Always with her bagel and cream cheese. Always there. The youth ministry continued to grow, and she went. I mean, we were so proud of her. You know, she, she took a stand for righteousness at her, her school campus where there was all kinds of anti-Jesus stuff. She took a stand and we're like, wow, this gal, we are proud of her. And then she goes to Bible college. Four years of Bible college, comes back, more training, tremendous heart. Boom, jumps right back into the thick of things and says, I want to serve. I want to get involved in my church. I've missed, I've missed serving in my local church, in my ministry. Dives head first, gets involved with the youth ministry, joins our internship program. 
we highly recommend internship programs. Meets her prophetic destiny there. His name is Ben. It's another story right there. I had the privilege then of a few years later actually marrying Andrea. I was already married, but I'm saying performing the marriage, amen, just <laughs> officiating the wedding. And then I also had the privilege of watching her give birth to her, her little princess, and we called her princess, and then she has a little baby. Actually, we didn't watch her give birth. That was not a good thing. But we saw the aftermath of what happens after nine months. That's what I meant to say. Jesus, help me. Help me, God. Help me. Our viewers online, this is family talk. Just celebrated seven years of marriage is a few months back and we we celebrated that together as a, as a family and friends and watching fruit that remains and it's not because she's not a success because of oh all of her success is fruit of what pastor elaine and i did no we got to play a little part in it but that has been fruit that has remained for generations she was part of the very first group of five young people that we pastored 18 years later she's still along for the ride and we're dreaming together. That's fruit that remains. What kind of fruit are we seeing in our lives? What kind of results are you seeing in your lives? What are the choices we make right now that will have lasting effect more than just this, this next summer? We choose today. Dr. Yangi Cho said this, 